to be here in Neuchâtel. Uh, and as Janine already said a couple of minutes ago, to be back here, because I did attend one or two uh, conferences here. Um, and so Matisse and I did work together when Matisse was in uh, Amsterdam at the University of Amsterdam. Um, what I will try to do is rather ambitious because I want to present a book, a full book, uh, and that's actually quite impossible. So I will be selective. Perhaps we can circulate the book. Yep. Um, I will be somewhat selective. I will mostly present the core argument, which is not that complicated. Uh, but just to say that the book has a couple of chapters I'm not going to deal with, but that can be part of the Q&A. Um, I mostly present our analysis uh, of what's going on and not so much what we can do about it, right? So the two last chapters are about hope and actually somewhat promising in the title, I'm afraid, hopeful liberalism. But I'm not going to say much about hopeful liberalism uh, directly, but there is there are two chapters in the book, uh, which is actually rather rare for me. I didn't do that before. But I think that the situation is so urgent that we have to think as scholars also about strategies, right? So we can come back to that. And there's also a chapter on left-wing nativism. So to make it clear from scratch that nativism is not just something embraced by the right or the radical right, but also by some left-wing parties. I'm not going to deal with that immediately. Um, as you already said, right, the book is somewhat comparative, it's mostly about the Netherlands and not because I'm from the Netherlands necessarily because why would one's country be interesting? But in this case, the Netherlands is somewhat interesting given that many people are surprised that nativism is even developing in a liberal, tolerant, multicultural country. Well, whatever those adjectives say about the Netherlands, we can discuss about that. But um, the Netherlands is presented as an improbable case for the rise of nativism, uh, like France and the US actually, because in the literature we teach our students that uh, liberalism might safeguard our countries from the rise of nativism, given certain characteristics of liberalism, and particularly then in France and the US, um, you solely. But I, I come back to that. Um, and I will indeed try to say something useful regarding Switzerland, but very much myself basing myself on the article that you already mentioned about gender uh, nativism. Uh, so we come, I come back to that uh, as well. Um, I guess that I don't have to convince you that there is a rise in nativism and that it is very much linked to, but not exclusively to uh, the rise of the radical right in Europe. And I made this uh, chart is mapped a couple of months ago, but I have to say it's already outdated. Um, yeah, so I will be rather normative, sadly enough, uh, to the extent that in quite some countries like the Netherlands, uh, we are now in the blue uh, color, the dark blue color, with uh, the victory uh, of the radical right during our last elections. And as you see, right, this is the European Union. That's the only reason why Switzerland isn't there. And we can discuss whether the SVP is really radical right or not. I understood that there was some discussion about that. But at least uh, there's something to say about nativism in Switzerland as well, I guess. Uh, and uh, overall, the picture, if you look at Germany or France, right, at least in the polls, uh, Front National and the AFD are much higher already. So this is just to give you an impression of a couple of months ago, uh, but Europe is coloring darker and darker uh, blue. So we have to see what is happening. And as you already mentioned as well, uh, we have a, a rather simple um, uh, argument. And the argument is that many forms of exclusion and discrimination and that we are experiencing in the Netherlands, but not at all exclusively in the Netherlands, that these forms of uh, exclusion, whether it is uh, anti-black racism or Islamophobia or populism, that all those forms are deeply colored by nativism. So nativism is the core of the exclusion of those different forms of exclusion. Uh, and I will elaborate on that, but the presentation will be rather simple. So I just will discuss anti-black racism, Islamophobia, populism, and I will show how nativist those forms of exclusion 
uh, have uh, become. But before we do that, uh, let's me, let me briefly introduce nativism so we have the same kind of idea what we are talking about. Therefore, I don't like definition discussions too much, but uh, to be on the same page, it can be useful, right? So what is nativism? Inspired by the American historian, historian John Hayam, we define nativism as, as you see, an opposition to an internal minority, internal minority, that is seen as a threat on the grounds of foreignness. And um, this is actually not literally Hayam's uh, definition, as you might know, because he's speaking about foreigners, which is quite an important difference. I come back to that. Um, but the main opposition here is between foreignness and nativeness. Foreignness refers to people, practices, or ideas deemed to come from elsewhere. It, re it refers to people who are, who are there or who are here, but not from here. To those who are in the place, but actually perceived as being out of place. So foreigners, aliens, strangers. Nativeness refers to people, practices and ideas who primordially belong to the soil. Those who are of the place, indigenous or autochthonous. And what turns nativeness into nativism, and that is the other central element that constitutes nativism, is the perception that foreign forces pose a threat to the native population. This is not a normative, but an analytical definition. At least we propose it as an analytical one. And actually it's not limited at all to our actual situation or Western countries. In order to understand what was happening in the period of decolonization, for instance, the same definition makes sense that it was a majority of the people in those countries fighting against a minority that was colonizing their country, right? Of course, the difference is that today minorities are overall powerless and the majority is powerful in our countries, whereas in the colonized countries, right, it was the majority that was rather powerless and the minority, but still the definition holds, right? And I think that's important because clearly decolonization did mobilize nativist uh, sentiment, right? So again, there already, right? It is not like that all forms of nativism are necessarily bad, or we can discuss whether there is bad and good nativism. Uh, but I will mostly discuss the empirical situation of countries in which the majority, the powerful majority is nativist and is excluding those who are perceived as being non-native. Uh, so this as a start to understand what nativism is uh, about. But let me go to the three forms of nativism. And there he is already, uh, and that is Geert Wilders. Uh, he is the leader of what is now the biggest party in the Netherlands, 23% of the votes, the party for freedom. Um, and um, of course, as I already said, there are several types of nativism in present day Western countries, but the most prevalent flavor of nativism, at least in the Netherlands, but perhaps also in Switzerland, is religious nativism, which portrays Islam and Muslims as a threat because they are allegedly fundamentally different from national and European cultures. At the center of these cultural antagonisms are, and there we get very close to the article already cited, um, at the center are notions regarding gender equality and sexual freedoms. So in the Netherlands, almost all partic political parties don't stop talking about gender equality and sexual equality. So it's a lot about homosexuality as well. The Islam is, re Islam is reduced to its most radical version and depicted in terms of oppression and backwardness. So it's very temporal, right, the argument. Whilst Dutchness is seen as the embodiment of liberalism and secularism. Whether the differences concern politics, culture, or religion, the underlying opposition is always between temporality, right, modernity, and backwardness. And particularly interesting, and I'm curious to know whether that's the same in Switzerland, but particularly interesting is the fact that Christianity plays an important role. Um, and yes, I mean, the Netherlands is one of the most secularized, secularized countries in the world, right? More than 50% of people don't define themselves as religious, but we do still have a kind of Bible belt in the Netherlands. So there are real Christians in the country or Orthodox reformed Christians, 
Uh, but they are totally uh, ignored in this discussion about Christianity. So it's not about them, uh, the practicing Christians. Uh, another version of Christianity is actually uh, totally uh, and increasingly instrumentalized in nativist discourse. Christianity not as a religion in terms of a confessional identity and practice, but as a general and vague heritage and cultural identity. In this self-image we call cultural Christianity, Christianity goes hand in hand with secularism, surprise, surprise, and liberalism, glossing over a long history of conflict, right? And well, there are many examples in the book, but one of the most, well, I don't know, I want to say funny examples is the following. There was the leader of the Dutch Christian Democrats, uh, Buma, and during the elections of 2017, um, he said that gender equality has been a Christian tradition for thousands of years, which is kind of special reading or rewriting of history, right? I mean, the Netherlands was one of the most conservative countries in Europe up to the 1960s, and uh, particularly during 18, 1850 to 1960, uh, the Netherlands were extremely conservative, particularly regarding gender and sexuality, and still, gender-wise, there's a lot to say whether or not the Dutch are progressive, right? Uh, but then a Christian Democrat is going to tell us that it is very compatible with Christianity and a part of Christian uh, tradition. The point I want to make here clearly is that it, this is not a religious dispute uh, with Islam, right? It is the idea that Muslims are not Dutch, cannot be Dutch, that Islam is not compatible with Dutchness. So it is not just a form of Islamophobia, it's nativist Islamophobia, right? And that is the point I want to make. So this is the first example that it is a type of nativism. It is nativist Islamophobia or religious um, nativism. And the same is true for the second form. I have to apologize for the horrible pictures, um, blackface figures, but I decided to put it out there because I have to explain what's going on there, which is a very shameful uh, thing in itself. Racial nativism is another type of nativism revolving around issues of racism and demographic shifts between white Europeans and racial others. The nativist discourse on Black Pete, and this is about Black Pete, is a case in point. The anti-racist who criticized the Dutch tradition of Black Pete, and Black Pete is a servant of St. Nicholas, right? So that is a very much racist stereotyping going on there. So the anti-racist anti are regarded by the nativist as a threat to the Netherlands, right? So that is how the debate developed in the past years. Um, not only are the anti-racists blamed for creating division and hatred instead of national unity, but more particularly because their anti-racism because their anti-racism is racist towards white people. Because the tradition is our tradition, is our white tradition, and how do they dare to criticize our traditions? Well, obviously, this is nothing new, right? I mean, there is an echo in uh, the critics regarding Black, Life uh, Black, Black Lives Matter movements. Nativists, Dutch nativists, perceive all affirmative action policies related to diversity and inclusion and anti-racism as anti-white racism. In other words, anti-anti-Black racism is interpreted both as an assault on Dutch culture how dare these foreigners criticize our traditions and as a form of reverse racism, right? So that is the way they try to uh, frame it. Um, a more radical version of racial nativism explicitly and often implicitly mobilizes replacement theories. Uh, über, über Bevölkerung, something like that, right? What is the, the, the German word? Revolving around the idea, as you know, right, that uh, whether intended or unintended, white Europeans will become in the near future a minority in Europe in the demographic race with non-whites from Africa and the Middle East. Metropoles like London, Paris and Berlin foreshadow in their perspective the predicament of a continent as a whole. Yeah. <laughs>
that racism and racial nativism have simultaneously become more explicit and normalized in public discourse does not mean that the taboo on racism has totally disappeared. Even racists don't want to be called racist. And that, no, that's interesting, right? Because with Islamophobia, people are just saying in your face that Muslims, at least in the Netherlands, horrible things. Whereas when you label clearly white people who act racist as racist, they are still, no, no, the Dutch cannot be racist, right? The Dutch are liberal and progressive, so the Dutch cannot be racist, right? That's kind of impossible, even if they embrace black-faced traditions and things like that. And this is why nativists often use euphemisms like demographic changes instead of racial replacements. And Geert Wilders, and that's pertinent given that he might become our prime minister, Geert Wilders defends himself against the accusation of racism by stating that he has not so much against Muslims, only against Islam. Right? So, well, this is the way of reason. Um, again, this is not just anti-black racism, how horrible in itself, right? It is a specific form of anti-black racism. It's the idea that Dutch black citizens cannot be Dutch, even as most of them and most of the people who mobilized against the uh, black face tradition, even uh, most of them are Dutch citizens and have been Dutch citizens against their will, right? Because they were part of the former colonies. So that doesn't matter. They don't perceive black Dutch citizens as Dutch, so the very idea is that uh, anti-black, uh, anti-black racist people who mobilize in that way disqualify themselves as being Dutch. So again, it's nativist. It is nativist uh, anti-black racism, and not. And I will come to the comparison with the U.S., where it's slightly different. But in the Netherlands and perhaps in Europe, clearly it has to do with the self-definition of the Dutch as being um, white. The third and last type of nativism is populist nativism. And there we see the leader of one of the other radical right parties. He actually was the biggest uh, party like five years ago. So all the time there's another uh, radical right party that wins elections. He won the provincial elections that year. He is now dwarfed because most of his focus went to Wilder's party. Uh, but he is a clear example, not of just of populism, but again, of populist nativism. So in addition to Muslims and blacks, there is a third group deemed a threat to Dutch, the Dutch native population and its culture and identity, and that is the liberal elite. The nativist discourse on the elite we call populist nativism. Here the elite is attacked for being too cosmopolitan and alienated. Often there is a kind of anti-Semitic undertone there as well from national culture. They are also attacked for the elite for betraying Dutch people uh, because the elite then is celebrating and privileging immigrants, right? So there's a coalition between the elite and immigrants and other minorities at the expense of the native population and its culture. And this applies then to material matters. So the suggestion all the time that the elite is privileging migrants in terms of housing, right? All kinds of material things, but also regarding cultural issues like the Black Pete tradition or the way we teach history of the Netherlands. And it is important to realize that this is just not a regular form of populism, right? Uh, it is populism because it is criticizing the elite, but the elite is criticized not just for being elitist, but for betraying the people, right? So it is a form of nativist populism. And there's a, straight, there's a strange thing there going on that actually uh, Baudet is extremely part of the elite himself, but he can hide because he is the Dutch guy. He is a native. Uh, and so he is not criticized at this moment. On the contrary, he's embraced as one of them, of the Dutch uh, white uh, people. But due to its multicultural affinity and loyalty, the liberal elite is depicted as a self-hating, self-destructive group of traitors who contribute to the nation's downfall, whether through passive neglect or active strategy. And again, it is extremely important to realize it's not just populism. 
it's nativism and you may say yeah but listen listen the elite how can the elite be portrayed as un-dutch well that's happening all the time so the liberal elite is pushed out of the country um, and therefore in the definition it's important not to, to talk about foreigners but foreignness right because the elite is embodying foreignness i mean obviously there are no foreigners right but they are portrayed as un-dutch as betraying dutch culture and therefore we had a slightly broader definition of uh, nativism as you saw at the start very briefly how do the do those three forms of nativism compare uh, and are there not any gradations there yes there are gradations and they are important and i will try to elaborate on that and uh, there are gradations in uh, the degree of foreignness uh, the degree of being perceived as a threat um, the degree of being excluded and also uh, a different uh, in terms of the extent to which native ids are more fringe or more mainstream but before i say something about those differences it is important to realize what the ultimate uh, consequences of nativism are because if you define uh, a people and a culture and a territory like all linked together and uh, as sacrosanct right as really this is the core we are the native and we possess this country and we have the right to feel at home and we truly belong well what then is eventually the only solution for those who are not perceived as natives right that they have to leave or even worse i mean and that's what we see happening in the dutch discourse so you might know that wilders at a certain moment a couple of years ago said what do we want with moroccans more or less and then his people shouted less moroccans and that was he was put on trial and he was condemned right so now we will have a prime minister being condemned for saying such a thing so which which is something uh, but it shows the logic it's the same with the afd proposal in the past weeks right i mean that for them the only solution if you are a hardcore nativist the only solution is that the non-native should leave the country so the afd is not an aberration or something like oh well that is surprising no it's it's the logical consequence of radical nativism having said that not all forms of nativism are radical right so that's also important to take into account even though i will be brief on that so first of all foreignness right even though yes the liberal elite is depicted as being foreign to the dutch culture obviously it matters that they are not real foreigners that they do ha all have of course citizenship and uh, a rather privileged position perhaps in the country right so they are less foreign than many muslims and many dutch black citizens foreign in in the perception of uh, the radical right right so there is a degree of foreignness there there's also a degree in uh, being perceived of a, as a threat so even though there was a huge battle regarding the blackface tradition of black beat in the long run actually that it was a successful mobilization and black the black face figure is about to disappear right so there is change there and many people now agree why would we have such a figure is it when it is so harmful to a part of our population so that is changing but the big fear is remplacement so the big fear is like why people becoming a minority and that is something unimaginable so people don't think in terms of a mainstream that can incorporate people of various colors right they really think that the Netherlands should remain uh, a majority white uh, country so there again there are threats but not all threats um, there are bigger and smaller threats let's say um, and also exclusion right um, appears in gradation exclusion can be temporary in the sense that then the idea is okay we have natives and non-natives but in the long run migrants can become more dutch right so people can become native over generations so that is a less radical form of nativism that you say well at the moment clearly they are not native right but in the long run they perhaps can become slightly more uh, dutch 
But obviously the radical right doesn't believe that, right? Because they think that there is a principle um, incompatibility between, for instance, Islam and whatever they say, right? Judeo-Christian um, culture. Um, so there are gradations in terms of exclusion or per permanent exclusion. Um, but yeah, those gradations are really gradations and we do hear quite some radical voices there. Um, and fourth, not only limited to the far radical, uh, far and radical right, but also we hear a lot of um, nativist arguments by the moderate right. And as I already said, in the book we also analyze that nativist arguments are used by the left. Um, and we try to understand why that is happening and we are analyzing the leader of green left who often doesn't do that. So often he makes a more general argument in favor of LGBTQI rights or women's rights in terms of human rights, right? But sometimes you also say, well, that's actually because those are Dutch values. And if people then don't agree with those values, they become un-Dutch. So then he is playing the nativist card and saying, well, people who don't share liberal values are un-Dutch, right? So it's extremely difficult to not use nativist argument in a context where nativism has become the, the dominant frame, actually. And that is what's happening in the Netherlands. And curious to hear whether that the same is happening um, here. Um, two more remarks before I come to um, some comparisons. Something about the past. Um, Obviously, nativism relies on idealized images of the past, portraying the native population in terms of racial purity, cultural sameness, and also communal harmony. Well, I think that is slightly more difficult to do that in Switzerland, to the extent that there is more of a plurality, perhaps among those who define themselves as natives. But also for the Dutch case, it's actually totally surprising. As you might know, Dutch history, right, that... Uh, Protestants and Roman Catholics have been fighting its other for centuries. Uh, and, well, we never came really close to the situation in Northern Ireland. We were not far from it, right? So really, really the idea that there was a homogeneous population is, historically speaking, totally ridiculous. I mean, this country, the Netherlands, was very much divided and totally pillarized, right? So social life, political life, everything was organized in pillars, and for instance, for my parents, it was still totally impossible to bring home a partner that was not of their denomination. It was unimaginable, right? So they are both Protestants, therefore allowed to marry. Uh, but that was the Netherlands in the 1950s, right? A very traditional country, totally pluralized, pillarized. Uh, and it is really surprising how history now is rewritten as if there was a communal, as if it was socially cohesive, as if there is even a shared um, history. Um, and the recent, uh, in the recent rewriting of the history, uh, it's also interesting that you might know that in between the victory of the, the, the Baudet's party, radical right, and now the party of Geert Wilders, there was a victory of the Farmers' Party. Uh, and it's interesting to discuss mobilization by farmers these days. Uh, and the Farmers' Party became the biggest also like two years ago, uh, attracting the radical right votes then. Uh, and there is also something about history, right? Because uh, the victory of the Dutch Farmers' Party relied on idealized images of a rustic rural life not affected by the ills of multicultural metropolitan life. There is a double irony at play here. Former colonizing nations in Europe, such as the Netherlands and France, experienced people from former colonies and other non-European regions as colonizers, because that's the argument the radical right is making now, right? They are colonizing, they're coming to our countries, they are colonizing us threatening white native populations. And the second irony is that the same nativists who see themselves part of what they call then an anti-colonial struggle against the invasion of multicultural ideas and people 
still defend, glorify, and romanticize our colonial past. So this is, I, I really sometimes don't understand why these kind of framings are so successful because they are inherently so inconsistent. So people from the former colonies are not allowed to come to the Netherlands that had been colonized in their countries for centuries and speaking the language of being threatened by those who come to the Netherlands, but still glorify the centuries that we have been colonizing them, right? So this is really to, something to think about. A couple of sentences about liberalism. The functioning of liberalism in nativist discourse is highly ambivalent. On the one hand, liberalism is seen as the defining essence of Western civilization, rendering it superior to backward illiberal nations. Well, obviously, Orban doesn't, doesn't agree there, but many others. At the same time, when liberalism is pushed too far, so then it is called multiculturalism or wokeism, the nativist population position regarding liberalism changes from a defining feature of superior identity to a threat to the nation's tradition and culture, right? So the use of liberalism by the radical right is highly ambivalent. For nativists, the end justifies the means. Because the natives need to defend themselves, they think, it is justified to selectively use and dismiss liberal um, ideas. And perhaps we can come back to that as well. Okay, let's then perhaps uh, have a look at the Dutch case. Well, this is a little bit a childish map, right? So that is the Netherlands, so that you know. <laughs> this was mostly made for a presentation in the US. <laughs> um, but it is not necessarily interesting to talk about uh, the Dutch case so much. But what I wanted, wanted to do is to briefly uh, give you an impression of the discussion about differences between the Netherlands or some Western European countries and the US. Um, and that also then brings France in the discussion, given that France and the US, as you might know, have the same kind of way to acquire citizenship, right? So access to citizenship is mostly, I mean, a lot to say about that, but still mostly uh, built on you solely. Uh, compared to Jus Sanguinis, uh, which is more of a German tradition, as you might know, the originally Brubaker um, argument. Um, but the Dutch, the Dutch case might be interesting, given indeed that the idea is that the Netherlands is such a progressive country. And in terms of support for all kinds of moral issues, from the start of life, abortion to the end of life, euthanasia, Sexuality, gender, on all those subject drugs policies, we are liberal or we are progressive and even to a surprising uh, extent, right? So really not only the center right, but also the radical right, more to say about that, but uh, at least um, embracing, for instance, gay marriage. So 94% of the Dutch are in support of gay marriage, which is I'm kind of high of quite an incredible number. Um, that says something, uh, but that also shows that people who are liberal can be very intolerant, right? So the very idea that if you are liberal, that you are tolerant, I mean, well, obviously that's not the case. So embracing liberal values doesn't mean uh, that you're tolerant towards those you think who don't share in those values, right? So you are disqualified then as illiberal. So the Dutch, are still progressive, are not tolerant so much anymore and have never been multicultural, but we don't have to discuss that uh, today. So two more parts in the presentation. I hope I do fine. I will try to limit myself uh, 10, min 10 minutes. Uh, the US first, but very uh, briefly. Um, so often, it's said that the US, but also France, are safeguarded against nativism um, because of the U Soli uh, tradition. Um, but the US also because it is an immigration country. And immigration countries, then, in the literature are often portrayed as well, there are not everybody is an immigrant, right? This kind of idea, the way New York is selling itself, right? The city of immigrants. So the idea is that you cannot really be a native. Well, if I don't know whether you read the book by Hayem, 
otherwise do it because it shows that the U.S. has suffered from nativism uh, since its start. Uh, and often groups that just arrived wanted to close the door behind them and to be acknowledged as the true natives, right? So it, nativism is really actually characteristic, characteristic for the U.S. And the idea that immigrant countries cannot be nativist is empirically, perhaps sadly enough, not uh, true. And the same, I, th I think we have to say the same about you solely versus you sanguinis. Uh, and I think Brubaker, but he seems to acknowledge that himself as well, was just wrong, actually. I mean, of course, right, there is the rise of the AfD now in Germany. So clearly uh, things like that do happen in Germany as well. But we still have to remember that Germany did receive almost 1 million Syrian refugees and France only 40,000, right? So, I mean, there are huge differences there in... And then to say, well, uh, Germany will be less incoming, uh, welcoming and Germany will more think in terms of natives and France will don't want frame Frenchness, Francité, uh, and nativism cannot be part of the French culture. Well, sadly enough, it's very much at the core of uh, republicanism, which uh, is perhaps not easy to understand, but sadly enough, it's true, right? So the very idea that there are not that many differences. I'm mostly struck by writing the book by the similarities among all those countries, and including uh, the US, even though there might be some differences. Very quickly, um, anti-black nativism, um, perhaps, perhaps anti-black racism is slightly less nativist in the US than in Europe. I mean, actually, when I discuss this with American colleagues, they disagree among themselves. Some will say, well, yeah, that's true, because actually the Americanness of black people is not questioned so much. Uh, there are African-Americans, but others will say then, yes, there are African-Americans where other people don't need a hyphen, right? Because they're just Americans. So at least there is a core identity of WASPs, right? The, the white African, that those there. Um, compared to others, and also the birtherism by Trump, right? So questioning uh, Obama shows at least that not only that there is racism in the US, because that everybody acknowledged that, but that it, it is also somewhat linked to the idea who are the true natives, even though, of course, it's not about the, 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 the First Nation natives, right? But then the natives who perceive themselves as the core of the US. American Muslims, there are quite some discussions there as well among uh, uh, our fellow scholars. They basically disagree. I think overall, um, Islamophobia is slightly less nativist um, for various reasons. I mean, the position of religion in the US at least is less embattled than, for instance, in the Netherlands. So to be critical regarding a religion is more difficult. Um, um, but there were also other arguments that are not so convincing, I would say. They said, yeah, but it is because Muslims in the US are more middle class than Muslims in France and the Netherlands, for instance, uh, or it's a smaller group. But there, I mean, we really do we have to do comparative work, right? So if you think about the history of anti-Semitism, I mean, sometimes there are barely any Jews somewhere, but anti-Semitism can be very widespread. And obviously, Jews are often attacked because they are middle class, right? And then there's a different kind of criticism or upper middle class. So I, I'm not immediately convinced that that is protecting Muslims in the US, actually. Nevertheless, perhaps they are slightly more acknowledged as being co-American uh, citizens than at least in the Netherlands. And finally, populism. I think there, it, populism is as nativist in the US, as it is in my and perhaps also your country. Um, uh, Trump is all, all over like true Americans and criticizing, of course, the elite and Washington and uh, also that the um, left wing Americans are alienated from the ordinary men, cosmopolitan. And there's also this undertone of anti-Semitism, right? Suris, uh, criticizing Suris and so on, right? So there is a lot. Uh, it is populist, and there is a lot of discussion about being truly American. 
And then the nativist discourse is so strong in American politics that the Democrats are using all the time Obama and Biden, uh, blaming the Republicans as being un-American, right? So being un-American is really part all the time of the discussion. And you have to be American. So it's not about certain rights as being universal human rights. It's all about whether or not it is uh, American. And then the last words, a very, there's a lot of hesitation about Switzerland, and thanks for those of you who helped me here a little bit. Um, what I learned was that the Swiss People Party um, in the literature is often perceived as radical right party, but not by all, but at least as a rather radical right party or conservative party with rather clear uh, nativist ideas. Uh, so uh, with a rather sheer, sharp distinction between natives and non-natives. And um, obviously I learned a lot from uh, Janine's and Stefan's article and this notion of the Eidgenosse, which I found extremely intriguing and I love to hear also how that sounds in Reto Romanisch and Italian. I, in the French, it was Citoyen, Citoyen de Souche, or that's more the French. But clearly all very native, nativist um, uh, terms. And then compared to the papier Schweitzer or the paper switches, yeah, like those who are only on paper, but not truly and emotionally and culturally uh, like that. Um, um, thinking about which groups are blamed and nowadays perceived as non-native natives in Switzerland, when I'm well informed, I think there are, again, many similarities actually, right? So the former guest workers, and in your case, also people coming from the former Yugoslavia, first, perhaps not being perceived so much in terms of being Muslims, but over time, there's a certain Islamization of them. And uh, a lot of the discrimination is then based on uh, Islamophobia. At least that's what happened in the Netherlands. So. In the, in the 60s and 70s when they came uh, from Morocco and Turkey to the Netherlands, it was barely about their belief, right? And more recently, it's all about them being Muslims. Um, and I'm curious to know more about racist nativism in Switzerland, like which groups are uh, included there from Africa, from other parts of the world, given that the history of Colonialism is slightly different here than from other countries, even though Stefan explained to me that this is a country of colonizers without colonies or something like that. So uh, not to say that uh, anti-black racism doesn't have a history here as well, but in a perhaps different way. Um, and perhaps the same for populist nativism, that there is a strong critique of the cultural elites more than of the economic elite. So it will be interesting to think about how nativist populism is here. And then I get totally puzzled, I have to say, because I teach my students always that nativism is about one people, one culture, one language, one territory. Well, here we are. <laughs> so that is really intriguing, right? And of, obviously for you, it's not a new question at all. It is more that in the debate about to better understand uh, nativism, Switzerland is then such an important case. Because how then is the native in Switzerland constructed while being internally fragmented? And that implies then obviously that the Swiss identity is overarching. Uh, but learning from political science, there are so many countries that do have more than one, one language. Uh, but where the, their own language is the most important one, right? That Belgium is an obvious case, right? And we, of course, learn always about Belgium. And Belgium, then you would say, well, is there not a native Belgium identity? Well, there's not, right? There's a Walloon and a Flemish identity, but not a Belgium identity. So obviously, but that's probably nothing new for you. The Swiss identity is really a different identity, even when it has to hold together four languages or for groups that identify differently. Um, so there, there I think um, 
how is the inside constructed by the outside? So how is the, how are what boundary work is going on? So which groups are perceived as non-Swiss or non-native Swiss? And is there anything of a blurring boundary there? So are some people becoming Swiss over time? Uh, but also what does it do that internally it is slightly more fragmented or diverse at least than uh, the Netherlands? Because last sentence, the Netherlands actually became a rather homogeneous country, at least like the, the, those who perceive themselves as natives. So we were very divided, right? perhaps like Switzerland, even though not in language, but particularly in terms of religion. Uh, but religion plays a role here as well. Um, and after the 1960s, we, we became actually a very homogeneous country in terms of values and behavior and so on. Uh, whereas that seems to be slightly less the case here. But please tell me when I'm wrong. Thanks. Thank you very much. So much, Jens, and I will give the words to Janine, who will answer your question. How is it me? <laughs> anyway, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to start the discussion. I think many people here would like to contribute, so I will try to block off hello. And uh, first of all, many thanks for your talk, as many thanks for your book. And uh, I mean, you know that your work is very much resonating also with my own work, and I always find it very insightful and inspiring and also very useful. And of course, there would be so many things to say, and particularly also about Switzerland. And really, my comments a little bit talk about Switzerland, but yeah. not only. I think others can add, and maybe later we can also talk about it. Start by saying that I really think that uh, with this book you you really make an important contribution. It's an important discussion we must have nowadays. I fully agree with you. What is nativism and nativeness? How can we identify it? How in which configurations does it play out in different places? And your book, of course, does a lot contribute to this debate, but also what are the consequences? And uh, from a normative point of view, also, okay, how to produce, produce alternative narratives? And I still would be a bit curious to hear you about it, this. I didn't read your book, I told you, I read the introduction, but not the whole book. Well, and as there would be a lot to say, I, there are, as far as I but I did read, there are many also two things which I think are extremely uh, interesting and important when we talk about this. The first is your argument that nativism is coming in the Greece. I mean, there is kind of lighter forms of nativism and there, is a, there are stronger forms of nativism. And I think this is a very really useful argument in order also to do very careful analysis in different places. And also the, the way you kind of uh, describe these particular logics of nativism. So it's a, a threat to these people are threat to the nations, then the construction there is a group belonging to the soil, others are foreign, and exclusion is the best way of coping with it, basically. And I really think that this kind of uh, middle-range theories are extremely important for social science. There's a general mechanism. But then we need to really carefully investigate local and historical context in order to elaborate what does nativism and nativeness mean in these different contexts? How does it, what does it also mean in different times? And I'm quite grateful for this because at least currently this is a tricky time of the in some of the sites. There's this kind of tendency to import concepts and mm. we're not always doing careful enough to analysis of a lot of context. So I, I really think this is extremely useful. And Switzerland is, of course, an important or an interesting case. And I would even say this, I will come back to Switzerland, just some words that we have here from of cultural nativism that takes a slightly different twist from what we were mm. describing. Mm. I mean, we have this idea of over-foreignization, which is like the, the foreign as a threat to Swiss spirit and culture, which is something which is very prominent since the beginning of the nation state, almost the formation, since the 1920s, actually. And it has been, this idea has been very much influential in politics, and it targeted actually different group of people. 
who are the two foreign people, the, the, those who are not native, a threat to Switzerland? The Jews, or those the socialists, yeah. feminists, by the way, they have been so on Swiss, particularly defined by the Catholic. So this is really, yes. But then later the Italians, the Germans, etc., etc. And as you already said, this distinction we had between Eichgen or the Confederate and Swiss or non-migrant citizens and migrant citizens, I think this distinction is clearly an atheist one, yeah. which is yeah. really, really strong. And this is valid, by the way, also for German and French, not only for black people or yeah. people of color, etc., which I think makes it even more complicated, basically. So there are really different forms of, of nativism here. Um, I will say something when it comes to, to, to language later. But I have mainly three points, really, where, or one point which has two arguments, which is maybe the most important thing I would like to say. You argue that we have a return of nativism. A rise, I fully agree with you, but is it really a return? I would suggest the counter hypothesis, and I'm definitely for two, not the only, the first one probably was coming up with this. I would argue that nativism and nativeness are actually fundamentally modern phenomena. And as you clearly also show, not in your talk, but in the book, related to modern nation state building and to colonialism. And as such, I think they are intrinsic to the logic of the na modern nation state. And you quote Charles Burke, like the question of people of the place and people out of place, and the different twists this takes in, in colonial, decolonial states, where native is something else. So if I talk about nativism in Canada, I mean, I really have to explain what I'm talking about, because you know, yeah. it's something really different. But you argue that liberalism, birthright citizenship, and being an immigration country would have been thought to serve as a safeguard against natives. But I was really thinking, who did argue like this? And why should they actually sell as safeguards? Isn't it rather a question of how, which lens we put on to look uh, on the world, also as researchers? Because of course, after World War II, we saw this internationalization of liberalism, the Declaration of Human Rights, etc. But we also could observe that the logic of the nation state became fully internationalized after the uh, Second World War and anchored also in the UN Charter, in these human rights, the right of self-determination of the nation. So it was always there. Did just researchers not see it? and went on this liberalism issue. I, I, I really, I cannot go into detail, but I really would argue that the logic of nativism, which you describe so, so really adequately, is basically intertwined with the formation of the modern nation state, and hence it's not a return. I would rather argue that nativism can crystallize at same certain points in history, can become more light at other points, but then it becomes more strong, like that, definitely, as it is instrumentalized by the right wing parties, but that it's intrinsic to the logic, it's always there. It is like uh, these classical sociologists who all thought uh, we would lose our primordial relationship and community would not be important anymore, we would all, would all be individualized. Yeah. And, yeah. Of course, they have been wrong. I mean, they didn't see this other kind of mechanism which have been uh, at, at play. And related to this, I was also thinking about your book talks, and you talked a lot about parties, about right-wing parties, left-wing parties. And I agree with you that, of course, these parties, they mobilized this narrative, uh, nativist narrative, and brought it really back. I mean, in terms of reinforced it. Not a return, but they reinforced it. Then. But I would argue that, at least in the Swiss case, nativism and nativeness is an everyday pattern that goes far beyond the party politics. And actually, it is really a, a 
a pattern how many people in this country interpret the world and make sense of the world. And this is also when we look a bit historically at Switzerland. I think that that's basically what, what we see. Nativism was here before the rise of the Swiss People's Party, which in my eyes is a right wing, a radical right wing mm -hmm. party. So when Switzerland was founded, first there has been quite strong Republican ideas, but then it switched quite fast before the First World War to more an ethnic understanding of nationality and also a nativist understanding. Yeah. Yeah. These were liberals, yeah. Catholics also, but also Protestant liberals, basically, who, who introduced this change. There was a strong debate at the uh, beginning of the 20th century that uh, Switzerland was actually not accepted as a nation within these European nations because we did, we had multiple languages and because there have been so many immigrants and the politics was about we are afraid we are colonized by the immigrants this was the yeah. beginning of the 20th yeah, yeah, century yeah. so this is already a nativist argument basically or when you look later before the second world war till the 50s swiss scientists have been absolutely internationally recognized for eugenics and race theory there are many good work of historians showing this. And this is, of course, about the national body, a healthy national body, which is a nativist argument, again, very yeah. clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And there you had who is, who should be ex, uh, ex, um, deported, again, of course, Jews, but also alcoholics, people who consume yeah. too much alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the, Romans, etc. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah. which I think is so. Basically, my argument is: Is it really a return, or does it take different shapes? And nowadays, we observe a particular form of nativism, which is strongly pushed by these right wing parties. Basically. And maybe another. No, I have already talked ten minutes. I stopped here. <laughs> there are really many things to say, so it's very inspiring. So thanks a lot, and uh, I think we will have other discussions. And we can come back also to the question of the language, maybe later. You want to briefly add? Um, yes, briefly. Um, though, I, uh, though I basically agree with your uh, argument. Um, um, we just like the title very much, I have to say. So there is this... Uh, you might know there is this famous novel in the US which is called The Return of the Native. Uh, and obviously we have been discussing because normally we would say The Return of Nativism, but that is not a book title. Um, but I'm going to defend it somewhat, even though I, I, I learn and I fully now acknowledge that uh, there might be national differences there. So, for instance, that the way it was mobilized, this idea of uh, over bevolking or uh, already being replaced or overwhelmed by foreigners, uh, obviously has to do with the development of and the founding of the nation states uh, in various. Uh, and so, for different for Switzerland, it might be different. Um, yeah, so the idea of the return is not to say that it had totally disappeared, but indeed that for well quite some decades in at least some countries, there was not so much of a debate about national identity. So when I tell my students that when I was studying in the late 70s, early 80s, till the mid 90s, we never discussed about Dutch identity. Dutch identity. I mean, it was just not the topic. Nothing was framed in terms of Dutchness, right? So there was this, this entire idea was not necessarily a taboo, but it was not at all the dominant frame. That doesn't mean, and you're totally right there, that implicitly there was a lot of Dutchness. And of course, there was also, we can discuss about that, but there was something like a Dutch culture that people or Dutch mainstream that people were participating in, right? So it's not to deny that there are such things out there, but it was not politicized in that, uh, in that way, even though it is the very basis of the development of a world system of nation states, right? I fully acknowledge that. And therefore, indeed, we have to uh, all read Nandita Sharma's book on um, uh, nativism. Uh, and particularly then how 
um, the post-colonial struggle actually uh, shows or legitimates very much this idea of self self de determination of people, right? And in that sense, I'm not sure whether we can have the discussion tonight. But I think my next book will be about questions of nativism and indigeneity. Because on the one hand, many progressive people are embracing indigenous people and so on, right? And of course, there is a different power relation there uh, compared to others. But there is the same idea that some people belong to the soil, right? Their territory, their culture, one people, one culture, many languages. But I mean, that is, that is the, there, so there is something about that anti-colonial uh, discourse that locks native people in the U.S. up in their territories, right? So there, there's a lot to be said about that, but it is not coincidentally uh, a similar development, but it is both showing how much uh, nativism is the, yeah, the fundament of uh, the modern uh, nation state, but that doesn't mean that it was always there in that, in the politicized sense, and that it was almost the main defining line in that sense, right? So that really depends on national uh, histories and the difference there. Uh, two things about, or one remark regarding the two safeguards, the use solely and the immigration. Well, I do think that a lot of Republican writers actually do argue that since everybody can become French, the notion of natives doesn't make sense. Yeah, everybody becomes a French native, right? But there, there are not, there are no, no non-natives because everybody can become French. And we are colorblind, right? So the French don't see color. It's like everybody is like French. Obviously, we are. We now know that republicanism is empirically totally, uh, in that sense, uh, improbable, right? Or it is the claims of, of of republicanism in that sense don't make sense at all. And we know that France is one of the most racist, anti-black racist country in Europe, right? So not being colorblind, of course, is. Totally not true. So the very idea of republicanism as the most inclusive system, not making the distinction between natives and non-natives is not true. And um, yeah, I think there are quite some scholars who still believe actually that immigration, immigration countries also that it doesn't make sense to have a sharp distinction between the natives and the non-natives because all the time people are coming in. But the thing is, not all the time people are coming in, right? So there have been waves to the U.S., obviously, uh, but there are still uh, 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 fellow scholars in the U.S. who think that it is ridiculous to talk about nativism in the U.S., whereas I think, well, actually, it's rather clear, even though it might be more inclusive to the extent that black people are more included than in the European context as national citizens, right? So horrible racism, but not being discriminated because you're not American. Yeah, thank you very much. So let's open the floor. Questions or remarks? Any other question about this? Um, by the oath or the how to deal with it? Because the way I understand native is what is native is that the use of the term native is a very selective one. So, for example, when you think about timing, at which point was the region of Hungary defined? Because it was a lot. Yeah. Was your Hungary, for example? Yeah. Same also for Russia. When was Russia defined? Who belongs? And for example, Stalin in Austria was a especially very mid place, USA. Also, at which point, why did the white people, or the colonizers, <laughs> become the natives, or as that have already been? natives. So I wonder, can we understand nativism is something that is used in a strategic way and mm -hmm. does understand it as a strategy that can mm -hmm. also be appropriated from less right-wing actors, for example, so that you use nativism as a strategic tool, you serve nativism basically and use it in a positive way rather than in an exclusive way. Yeah, I think there are examples of particularly social democratic parties, then they will mostly frame it in terms of patriotism. So, well, there's the famous article by the German sociologist, the most famous German sociologist, uh, Habermas. Habermas, about uh, what was the exact title? Exactly, right? So this is a form of claiming it. Um, I think 
really because that is, has that was a that was an ambition to be inclusive right so then not to make this is not the hard boundary work except that people living on the soil can be part of this patria and mm -hmm. uh, what we try to do in the book is indeed thinking about can you use it in a strategic way but um nativism has some characteristics that even though it comes in gradations it has a tendency to radicalize and to really think in terms of purity for instance whereas some elements that are used in nativism can perhaps be used also for a progressive politics so not nativism as such as we do see it develop in some of our countries but we have a, uh, a chapter on how history is used by nativists and we try to think about other other ways more inclusive ways of course it, it when you will when you want to have a convincing narrative about the netherlands or switzerland in the future it is ridiculous not to deal with the past right so we have to deal with the past and that is not necessarily regressive right there can be a story that is slightly more critical towards parts of our past but at the same time not disqualifying everything that happened in the past which is of course the reproach to uh, people criticizing uh, all dark sides of our past so uh, particularly um, the third author of the book uh, he wrote a, uh, the third author of this book wrote his own book on uh, progressive strategies in which he looked at uh, bottom-up uh, initiatives in this for in this case uh, Vancouver where people with various backgrounds came together and tried to build uh, a progressive movement in which rather traditional, yeah, in which rather, how do you say that, uh, not to become tautological, elements that you, one would perhaps not expect in a progressive uh, narrative, like tradition, like uh, rituals, even religion, can be forms in which yeah, mutual respect and things like that can be part of a progressive politics. So it, it has elements of a nativist uh, approach, uh, but it is used to be inclusive. I have to be, I'm a little bit skeptical, even though he shows that it is not like in some of the intersectional approaches that many things have to come together. They are looking for what really binds them so what is possible that many people share and not to ask from each other that not a maximalist strategy that we have to share all kind of uh, opinions about all topics but what brings people together in a rather minimum program but there are elements of ritual uh, tradition uh, and hope play an important role it's not a strong story yet i found but but we have to look like where right because we desperately need a better response uh, Anna. yeah um thank you so much for for the presentation um i was wondering when you, when you mentioned the um uh, radical nativism and as a logical consequence for foreigners for politicians that are radical nativists uh, to aim and to manage to make foreigners agree. Um, and I was wondering, have you, uh, writing the book, have you uh, reflected on cases in which we see politicians radical, that are radical nativists uh, in power, uh, and they're not able to do what they, what they discursively uh, promised? Uh, what, what then, uh, would it be worth to look at what then happens then, and what happens also in the support for them? Um, just, I was wondering if you also looked at that. Um, yeah, well, uh, somewhat. Um, I mean, radical right parties being in power in Western Europe is was is still rather rare. Uh, obviously, that's different in Hungary. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. I, in the introduction, I didn't deal much with where nativism is developing, also because it is developing in many parts of the world. We are focusing here on Europe, but it's obviously both in Eastern and Western Europe, and in Eastern Europe for a longer time. Um, and you're right, it is not easy, luckily enough, to push people out, um, but they are very effective in not letting people in. 
very effective, right? I mean, Hungary just doesn't allow any migrants, uh, basically, except for some uh, economic migrants they want uh, to work there. So it has very, it has enormous material consequences. But you're right; it's not just expulsion. It's it it, it is perhaps more about being extremely strict or not. Uh, letting any people in, and I, I don't know the numbers by heart, but I, how many asylum seekers find a place in Hungary in the past years? It will be close to zero, right? So it has enormous material consequences compared again to Germany, where one million people f uh, f affected by the Syrian war. So the, the differences are enormous, right? Even though, I mean, you can say, yeah, but Maloney is not very successful, right? Till now, so it is. It is not easy, depending on where they are and what kind of borders they have, um, to do it. Um, and there are legal uh, barriers because of the European Union. And one of the things that is discussed now in the Dutch coalition talks is to ask, like Denmark, to be not part anymore of the uh, regulations regarding migration for the Netherlands, because that's the only way that they can implement those radical measures. And, and well, look at Denmark, right? Or look at Britain and Rwanda or Denmark and Rwanda, right? I mean, these are, I mean, these are illustrations. This is not big scale, but it shows the same logic. And that's so worrisome, I think. I'm not sure I have a question. I have a comment that I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, no, I found the comment very interesting. Two things that I find very stimulating. First, that you want to have a definition of that nativism that can travel way beyond Europe and North America. And indeed, nativism is very much implicated in the colonial question. Mm. And there, nativism was used as a progressive yep. uh, And sure. actually, you might think that as pregnant as celebrity can. Nativism is just a matter of degree because it is part of the nation state border, but it's even a legalized form of discrimination. If you take the, the, the universal chapter of human rights, for instance, the only uh, basically uh, reservations as to the universal, supposed to be a universal application of human rights, is the lawful discrimination between citizens and aliens. And you would you know, find the exact same terminology. But I'm still wondering that the nativism would not be a term that is a bit too much tainted by the American experience. Mm. And we might want to use a term that is also part of the American story, but perhaps more. And I'm thinking of indigeneity, and that's why yeah. I'm interested in being mm. uh, here in the front of the book. And perhaps not even indigeneity, because of course it's been too painful, the indigenous question, but it's autochthony. And if you take the etymology of autochthony, it's not only the son of the soil, it's the son out of the soil, which means that the autochthonous person has a special right. And in nature, it's, a, it's not a mere fact of being born here. It comes with a time and space criteria, and this is very much up for debate. Hmm. Autochthony gives you a special right. And actually, interestingly enough, in a global setting, autochthonous people, that might be recognized. Yeah. There might be uh, lesser citizens, and yet you would have certain rights to self government and collective self government. But if you think of the, this idea of the time and space criteria, right, then nativism becomes much more enlightening. Um, you can have the nativism of ideas, but it's very much constructive. Think, for instance, of the category of Judeo Christian. I mean, we spent much of European history trying to expel the Jews, and yes. in a matter of fact, in case, we, through discourse, made them doctors. We made them native of Europe. Um, and the time and space with Miriam was a bit more enlightening for the case of France, because it's a resource, the fact of being born French for a lot of people from the uh, uh, post colonial populations, people who were born, whose parents were born in the Empire. But then the French, the native French, the France in the Sud, they don't know about, would actually argue, yes, but that was a long time ago. There's a space criteria. It was France, but it's no longer France. Mm -hmm. and, it and then it's always, always about setting the date. Think of um, uh, the colonial project of, um, uh, of um, the Jews in Israel. We are natives, because we were natives before you were natives. Mm -hmm. It can go really way back into the past. Same thing with the Rohingya. Rohingya, mm -hmm. if only we were perhaps 
migrants in the 17th century. Now they're treating them as immigrants. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Muslim uh, minorities in the United States. In, uh, so nativism, and perhaps autochthony would be, so the distinction would be between autochthonous and autochthonous, because it confers, it gives the concept a special right to the soil, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, and and I, I really think that if you take into account space and time criteria, you can pretty much account for any instances of um, nativism, whether progressive or mm -hmm. um, or uh, rather conservative uh, around the world. Yeah. Um, Perhaps one one observation, because I think the very fact that it is applicable to uh, in so many situations and so many contexts and times, right? If you think about why is nativism uh, in our days, it has such an intuitive plausibility. Why does it appeal so much to people? Is is exactly because it has also this progressive histories and undertone and the very idea, right? That that we barely can escape. So we are so much used not only to living in in nation states where we know whether others think that we belong or not belong, but we have so many practices that are extreme that are very nativist. Uh, and some of them are exclusionary uh, and others are for people totally normal. I mean, the same will be true, I think, in Switzerland. So in small villages in the Netherlands, if uh, it's forbidden to build new houses, but if new houses are built, it's only for the children of the people who live there. Uh, imagine that to do that in a city, right? I mean, that would be totally implausible. So there is something about the rural compared to the urban, that it makes sense to perceive them as autochthonous, as really belonging to the soil there. Whereas in neighborhoods of big cities, it's about mobility and not, not really getting rooted, uh, uh, so there are there differences, but it's, there are so many examples, lived experiences of nativist practices that to show, as we try to do in the book, and the exclusionary and the wrong form of nativism is actually very hard because of the past and because of the progressive role nativism played in and the colonial struggle. Even though, of course, the post-colonial states, but well, I mean, they thought they had to be homogeneous, right? So if you if you read the anthropologists like Geschier and others on Africa. It's, it's, it's one painful history because the idea was, right, we are one people who push out the white people and rightly so. But then the idea was, oh, but we are all natives or we have to be like one people, whereas obviously they were historically very, very diverse. So Sharma draws the most radical conclusion, right? I don't know who follows Sharma on Twitter, but it's all the time about abolition of states. <laughs> That's the only way out. This, this is, yeah, but that, that, I, we should really keep the concept of the line, and it can be very progressive. When, absolutely, but many, many progressive differences. But also, I have another comment, and yeah. it's not to jump in right. because it really, I didn't. I think the thing with nativism is that it produces also the national cohesion, and it's, a, it's affective. I mean, yeah. it has an affective sure. component yeah. and it produces inclusion as well, not only exclusion. And that's yeah. why it's so appealing. No, exactly. I think that's, yeah. that's yeah. a very important issue yeah. here. Actually. Yeah, and that's also linked to strategy, right? So I think progressive people should never say, we don't need any emotional bonds among people who are together in a nation, right? And particularly a welfare state, of course, assumes that people have a certain level of identification with others, otherwise they don't want to pay 50% tax, right? So it is necessary to a certain extent to share some mutual identifications. And in that sense, it's not a radical thing to say all that is wrong, uh, except when there is not an access to becoming part of and now to become citizen, not necessarily perceive oneself as a native. Yeah, thanks a lot for very, very uh, interesting discussion also, the super interesting input and um, keep, think keep thinking about like the terminology and the concepts. And I would also like to bring in a bit the empirical perspective on how to measure um, these things. So I'm someone who's been working a lot on xenophobia and nationalism, patriotism, with social psychologists, so they are also really the experts on these terms and how to, to measure them and I'll just try to find like a common um, terminology as well and understand better how exactly you measure the 
if if you measured it, okay, it's more like a qualitative district because it's really interesting. So I, I think this this founding myths or this this kind of uh, what Janine also said, like this this our community element is really something new that probably should also be included in like quantitative measures mm -hmm. of this kind. Because I mean, nationalism we have measures for nationalism where you think that your nation is better than the others. And nationalism clearly is clearly linked to xenophobia, so nationalists are more xenophobic. Whereas patriots, like if you're a patriot or a, a patriotist a person, you would rather say that I'm proud of my country, right? So it's like a positive assessment of your own country, and then you're not necessarily xenophobic. So that's what we had before the discussion. Yeah. So the empirical data from different countries and different settings confirm that these things they are we know they're not exactly the same. Yeah. And I was just wondering, okay, do we need yet another concept? Is that, well, and how does it yeah. fear of xenophobia? Yeah. Xenophobia is the fear of the foreigners, yeah. right? But if I get it right, this concept of nativism really goes back to the like the founding myths of our if it's autochthonous or if it's like more tied to the nation, if we need to yeah. talk more about nation, I think there is a very, very valid point. And what 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 I think is really interesting and here other countries come into play and also the US and Switzerland and um is that it's something that is popping up a bit all over the place and in very, very different democratic systems, in very different immigration societies. So we have Switzerland, a strongly consensual country with strong um, power dispersions at, at all levels of government. So Sean would be the expert to explain why the Swiss could create unity out of diversity um, as a Swiss nation, um, which is clearly also related to the political institutions. And then you have the US, a clearly majoritarian democracy. Um, so different, but we have these similar phenomena of, I would also say, yeah, nativist racism um, emerging. And maybe the last point on the US, because you said um, you think in the US racism, it's not really a nativist racism, but I mean, what we, no. what we observe no. most recently, maybe I've heard of these no. developments and of like a DeSantis who claimed to yeah. ask that Ilham. Oh, I'm sorry, her, yeah. her representative yeah. of Congress. Yeah. Yeah. So she should be expelled, um, excluded from the Congress yeah. and yeah. Um, no, no, they're clearly loyal to yeah. the country. Yeah. So denaturalized even. Um, I mean, what else is this than uh yeah. nativist nativism. racism yeah. uh, or nativist Islamophobia? Yeah. Perhaps very briefly, um yeah, so I fully agree if you don't need extra concepts, we shouldn't, but Nativism is, for various reasons, slightly different, I think, to the extent that what xenophobia is measuring and also patriotism is mostly, I think, or nationalism is mostly your country in relation to other countries, right? If it's Not about nation patriotism or national yeah. identity, this yeah. is really the feeling, okay, I feel close to Switzerland. Right, exactly. Yeah. Close to my and so that is compared, that, that's the, then the other is the external, the other countries. We are focusing, or nativists are focusing, on the internal enemy, obviously often associated with other countries, but it is the mm -hmm. internal enemy. Um, so it, it is a discussion whether nativism is different from ethnic nationalism. Is it not, right? Don't we you just use nationalism, right? Uh, but there are various forms of nationalism, as we know, right? Whereas uh, nativism is a form of nationalism, but not all forms of nationalism are nativist, necessarily. Um, and Xenophobia, I think, in most of the uh, surveys is really used to identify others, but not so much the left-wing elite, for instance, right? It's, so it's really about Xenos in the literal sense, where this is like slightly closer to the dominant group uh, still. We do have some data, uh, but there is no systematic data on like this broad perspective, uh, the spectrum of internal enemies, but um, really asking people whether they perceive their co-patriots as co... whether they think... well, concrete example. Um, in France, surprisingly, there is some research where um, black people are asked whether they think that white people think that they are French uh, and French citizens. And it is extremely disappointing results, right? So it's all that most black French people don't think that white people think that they can be French. Uh, 
not in terms of nationality or mentality, right? So that is the kind of data that gets closer to what we are describing, uh, which is highly, the fabrics about the emotions, right? So, and measuring emotions, but it is very much this idea that people are far from being French and that they know that themselves that, or they think that other people don't perceive them as uh, mm -hmm. French. So that that's not much data, but there is some data in the book regarding that. And I totally agree, this, we need far more quantitative data regarding this kind of questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Nito. There was the next one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I have a question. Like, you showed how this category or this sort of nativism could help us to understand something that we exclusive that and the nation state. But, and we discussed, but if it's good, then how will we could study the same or not, uh, this category is similar or similar. But do you really point at where the source of these different forms of exclusive dynamics are produced. Yeah. It's a rhetorical question, I think not. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> for instance, um, <laughs> some type of identification, for example, about first aid and uh, why you should pay so much taxes is necessary, but it's not maybe in. Would it not be interesting to, to measure the degree of acceptance of the construct of the nation state? Let's say among us, and and situate their first seeds or grains of 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 something that can produce at some critical points in history explicit dynamics, and right, I feel that there could be comfort on the level of, of understanding mm -hmm. how why actually repeat. Typically, again and again, in history, we are confronted with with um, age. Actually, yeah. Obviously, this was the elephant in the room. Um, uh, I should have said that actually there is a chapter on explanations for the rise or the return, or or the becoming explicit of uh, nativism, um, but. I, I guess that you will find the chapter a bit disappointing to the extent that we are mostly debunking uh, all kinds of explanations that are out there and uh, that simply don't hold. So normally there is a Marxist in the audience and the Marxist will say, well, well this is all class and you're stupid. Where are the socioeconomic things, right? Because clearly it's due to neoliberalism and... Uh, well, it's not. it's not... Uh, and we can, so we can show, I mean, given the fact that there are so many similarities across various, right? So political institutions don't explain much. Uh, socioeconomic developments, I mean, the Netherlands have never been so rich as we are today. Um, there was not an increase in inequalities in income in our country. And uh, so the, the, the numbers of migrants doesn't explain much to our country where there are barely any migrants. Uh, so all these explanations are just failing and and we we only have a tautological explanation basically that the success of the radical right is the success of the radical right i mean this is very like the summary but you get the point i hope right so um they have the best frame to understand what's going on and obviously uh, socioeconomic dynamics and perhaps also migration is a necessary condition but it is not a sufficient condition right so, Let's get a little bit more sophisticated. Not a sufficient uh, explanation for why there's such a race of nativism all around the globe, but particularly also in some Western countries where we didn't expect uh, it so much. And I just jump in here because there is also the other side of the of the population, the one the the, the, the part, and we observe this in our data. It's a large part population that is like a cosmopolitan, mm. multiculturalist who has a broad kind of a very inclusive view of the demos or of the nation of who should belong. So it's a period polarization, which brings me back to the power dynamics that yeah. we discussed. It's not just all about power, it's not just like the white backlash. Yeah. There's this nice book from the US, the white backlash. Yeah. Which, I don't yeah. remember your names, but uh, um, which I think is really convinced or Compelling, and you mentioned this argument yourself. Um, the fear 
that the majority becomes the minority, right? Numerically speaking, or in the US also in terms of electoral power. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what happens this year in the presidential yeah. elections, but it's a real issue there, not right? Like the Democratic yeah. Party, which uh, represents now the, the minority interests. Yeah. So is it not just why that question, like a counter reaction? Um, this search of maybe yeah, perhaps it's it's it, uh, yeah, perhaps I'm too Dutch to the extent then that I would say, or not Dutch, but I mean, those J Dutch people who deny that they can be racist, uh, now to the extent that, but why then would being white be so such an important identity for them, right? I, I, I frame it in a very naive way intentionally because that is not self evident at all. And actually, I, I'm still surprised that in many countries where we thought that we were beyond racism, mm -hmm. suddenly that is the main identity for people defining their voting behavior, right? I mean, that is not self-evident at all. Perhaps in, in the American context where race has always been so important and perhaps naively, right, so I'm self-blaming here, that it, the same is true in the Netherlands. It was just not out in the open. And just during the anti uh, the, the blackface thing, suddenly it showed how racist uh, uh, many people, many Dutch people were, uh, and not only this racist in the sense, um, but nativist racist. So not acknowledging that black Dutch citizens could, could even be citizens, right? Which, which for a colonial power is really something I just don't get my head around. Uh, yeah, so this is a learning curve there. But we still have to ask that question, like why would then they defend themselves in terms of whiteness, which is not a self-evident thing. Why would that be? Yeah, anyway. Maybe it's a package, like the white almost sucks in from the stuff. It's a, 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 a couple of characteristics. Um, I had a comment on the question. The comment was just um, around the class question that came up and also the different European societies. And I don't know if you read Akala's Natives. Um, he speaks about Britain and it's called Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire, I think. Um, and he really addresses the question of essentially who's not welcome in the nation state, always being, even if they don't know it, the working class and the racialized people. And so that together, especially if you embody both of those things, you'll never be a native. Um, but then, so there was a question around the elite and if that is applicable in the other, in the other situations that you look at. Um, and then the other the question was, um, the second part of the title of the book around can liberalism and safeguard of nativism, essentially, what is, where's there an answer? <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the questions. I, I, uh, for sure, I'm not able to answer them satisfactorily, but um, obviously, right, overlapping identities, and some groups are even, uh, it's more improbable that they are perceived as natives than others. And, and, and I'm not at all against taking class on board, right? It is just that there's always the Marxist question that I found interesting. But no, obviously, yes, right? And if we see, if we look into the discussions in many countries regarding migration, asylum, but also labor migration, uh, some migrants are good and others are not good, right? And working class migrants, uh, undocumented migrants, of course, are even perceived as far less belonging than other migrants and there therefore degradation is important right because some migrants seem over time to become part of the native or for at least of the mainstream if i may use that term uh whereas for others it seems just tot totally implausible in the perspective of those who perceive themselves as uh, as natives um yeah the safeguard so the thing is that, again, and perhaps in that sense, I don't want to say it's a necessary book, but the, the thing is we wanted to show that was assumed in, in a lot of the literature is doesn't work like that. It is not to say that it doesn't work at all, right? If you look, and that's coming back to the data, so where do we find the, the cosmopolitan people living in which conditions? And then uh, cities help, and that New York is portraying itself 
as a welcoming city is helpful, right? We, wrote, we did a comparative book on uh, Amsterdam and New York. It's a lit hubris, Amsterdam and New York. But uh, interestingly enough, it is about the mentality that you can create by telling the stories about that this is a city of immigrants. But even more interesting, New York still has a lot of institutions that are really helping people to become New Yorker. Uh, so because there is this ongoing history, so it's not to downplay that there are mechanisms that do help people to incorporate or to, to as Americans would say, assimilate into the mainstream. Uh, but those are not the big um, things that were often indicated in the literature, right? You solely or you sanguinis or being an immigration country. It really um, depends. I mean, there are immigration countries that are looking back, oh, why did we have those people getting into our country, right? So there should be a positive evaluation of, yes, we are an immigration country. The Netherlands is still totally in denial. We still think that we are not an immigration country, which is really ridiculous if you look back, but particularly if you look back the, the long term, right? but if you look back uh, the past 50 years. But also during what is still called the golden age, which is very painful. Um, in the 17th century, 40% of people in Amsterdam were not born in Amsterdam, right? So there are, there are a lot of stories to tell, um, good stories about immigration. But what we do here are negative stories about immigration. So it depends, which is a stupid answer, but it depends on what kind of stories are told about immigration. And then it can be helpful, yeah. And citizenship laws do matter. I'm not saying they have, they have very material effects. But sadly enough, you solely is not sufficiently helpful to counter nativism. That would be the argument. Yeah. Thank you. I think there are three questions. Following up on what Shalit said, um, you go even one step further and say, is it not? necessary that we have a nativist discourse? Is it not part of democracies that we constantly ask ourselves who belongs and who does not belong? Obviously, we can talk about the extremity of some of the proposals, like, you know, expelling whoever, taking away their citizenship. But if I think about a Swiss case, so we had votes on, uh, do we want to allow the construction of minarets? Uh, majority said yes. Do we want to ban the burning of a burqa? And the majority said yes. So. I mean, where would the benchmark or where would the standard come from to say that the majority of citizens are not allowed to feel and think that way? If it's a clean, proper, democratic vote where everyone who is entitled to vote can vote, now there's a problem there, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, that the answer that we should just extend voting rights and let more people participate in the democratic debate, but in, a, in and of itself, a nativist debate is not something undemocratic. Right, if you stay within the bounds of non-violent discourse. And as you said before, yeah. bring it out in the open, yeah. let's have a debate, with that, let's have a vote, and then move on, accept the result, or try again 20 years later. Yeah, well, obviously, um, when there's a majority of the vote, uh, often that should be followed. Uh, but the thing is, um, if, so uh, I'm a Democrat, mostly, but um, what, <laughs> no, but exactly. So why the obsession with uh, all kinds of things that people think that are not part of being Swiss, right? Which actually makes the Swiss community more homogeneous. Um, so of course, if there is a vote. But why this obsession with minarets that were barely there, I think, right? So what does it tell us about that those are the debates we are having today? Uh, and why would it, why is it necessary to frame almost all the things? Uh, and it would be interesting to look back because there will be many other topics uh, also be voted by referenda, right, in Switzerland. But um, why to have these kind of things that do have such exclusionary impact to rather small groups of others. Why this need to uh, think, to imagine ourselves as an homogeneous, right? So that is the, the link with nativism is at least its radical forms is that it is not inclusive. Of course, right? In democracy, it's about boundary making. 
But why are we these days obsessed by uh, full boundaries, strict boundaries, instead of thinking about blurring boundaries, indeed including people who perhaps don't have formal citizenship and give them some right of voting? So why? So it's not, of course, to criticize what uh, the referenda are about, but um, it's more a sociological observation. Like why this obsession, this uh, homogeneity, purity, and why, why not allowing for more pluralism? And indeed, is that not uh, the core of liberalism? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's uh, we live in a global democracy. Uh, nativism is essentially can be very democratic. Then the question is whether it is uh, liberal and protection of minority rights, mm -hmm. protection against uh, uh, the tyranny of the majority is uh, the traditional characteristic of liberalism. So, yeah, but as you said before, I mean, it is. It's legitimate to discriminate against people in the nation's technology. That's the way we have it. Of course, of course. So, so it is. It so we can say this is part of, of democracy. So, but still, you somehow have to. Sure, sure. I'm, 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 not, I'm not an open frontier guy, but it is like. No, no. The, 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 yeah, I like yeah. it also. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's yeah. complicated because for sure, for sure. in Switzerland, it's all, I mean, it is always a bit the argument. We cannot be racist, we cannot be sexist, we cannot be anything because we have the best democracy, the federalism, the direct democracy, etc. And I think this is a this is part of Swiss nativism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This whole argument is, I don't say you said it, but it's but for me, this is really part of, of how at least the Swiss nation. The homogeneity is created. Yeah. This is yeah. one of the, the small yeah. organs, the puzzles, yeah. actually. Yeah. Like the Dutch yeah. can be racist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. It's strange. Right. No, it's strange. Right. It's strange. Right. 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 Right.